Good morning. This side has the right idea. Let's all stand. Especially when you've run long and you've run hard and you've been faithful it can be it can be very difficult to maintain that passion and so Lord we would ask that this morning that that again Father you would burn like you did in Jeremiah where Jeremiah said that your words burn in me. Oh, that was my prayer again this morning, Father. Again, keep that passion alive in me, Father. Keep that fire cooking in my heart. Keep me in love with you and in love with your word, Father. And whatever you have to discipline in my life to keep me there, Father, do it. Don't let me slide. Don't let me drift, Father. Don't let me become unmoored from you, Lord, in that relationship that you've drawn me into. And so again this morning, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be here working in us and on us, Father, drawing us again ever so close, causing, Lord, every weight and sin to drop off. Lord, just bring us again to that place where your fire is burning in us, we ask. 
In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's kids would say, Amen. 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 Let's remain standing this morning.
says we belong to you. It's a wonderful thing, Lord. So may we, all of our life, Lord, strive to let your Holy Spirit control us and lead us to walk with you. That the things that we do and the things that we say, even the things we think, the meditations of our heart, Lord, be acceptable to you. We want you to permeate every fiber of our being, Lord. Lord, we want those duplistic moments that we all struggle with to be moments. Just moments, Lord, with quick repentance. So, Lord, we just pray you'd continue to grow us into your image. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Oh, 
and we magnify you and glorify you. We praise you with all of our hearts because you are stronger, Lord. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. As Pastor Mike says all the time, it doesn't matter what we've done, where we've been, what we've said, who we've done what to, Lord, your grace and your forgiveness, your blood can cover it all. It does. And it's on that basis we come, Lord, before you. Lord, you've said in your word that we can come boldly to your throne to call out for help in time of need. And so we do, Lord. We come before your throne. Let's all stand. thank you again this morning. 43 years. 
you have been faithful to me. 43 years ago, you rescued me. You didn't just save me, Lord. You redeemed me. You washed me in the precious blood of your Son. You filled me with your Holy Spirit. You gave me your grace, Father, that's sufficient, and your mercies that are new every morning. You called me your Son. You wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you gave me a hope that transcends this life. If you did nothing else, it would be more than any of us deserve. We sense your presence here this morning, Lord. And we know what you're saying as you say it so often to us. I don't want the works of your hands. I don't want the thoughts of your mind. What I want is your heart. I want you to love me with all of your heart because the Lord knows this morning that if he owns our hearts, that our hearts will make converts of our hands and of our heads. It's just the way it works. And so, Lord, I pray again this morning as we started out our service by singing that song, don't let the fire go out. I pray that in every heart here this morning in those you know, 25 different countries that we're in around the world, that are listening to the message this morning and 17 or 18 different satellite churches. I pray for them as well. Don't let the fire go out. Uh, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the blessed hope and the soon appearing of our Lord and God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to do that, Lord. So many we need to pray for this morning. And I want to pray for Nick, Lord, and we thank you that his back surgery is going well. I want to pray for Susan Stubblefield, Lord, and whatever's going on in her body, we pray that you would heal it, as well as Pastor Aaron and Leanne. I want to pray for Gary and Gil as they, you know, are coming to an end of their uh, 50th anniversary cruise, Lord. They'll be here on Wednesday, Lord. We pray, Father, for them. We pray for Max and Georgia that are down at a funeral. Pray for Dave and Barbara who are away at a wedding. Just, Lord, oh, so many people. And still have some sickies. You know, Lord, the, the flu and cold season is not done with us yet here in Grass Valley. We lift them before you. Pray for financial, marital, emotional, physical needs. But more than anything else, Lord, in these last days that we're living in, we pray for our hearts that you'd circumcise them afresh and new, Lord. Write your word, Father, upon them. And may, as Jeremiah said, your word, may it burn in me, that I can't but speak it. And those are the things we pray for this morning in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids that say, Amen. Amen. We'll take a few moments and spend some time greeting one another before you settle into your spot this morning.
Hey, Keith, Keith, it will. All right, if you guys can find your places, we'll get moving this morning. All right, if you guys can find your places. Okay. It's terrible that you have to ring a bell to get people to actually sit down. And we got a lot going on, man. Come on. We. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I think Jesus is going to have a big air horn in heaven to get you guys to sit down when we have the Merry Supper of the Lamb. Hey, I have some announcements, and every one of them are extremely important. Pray for the many in our fellowship that aren't here this morning. Some are traveling. Uh, some are traveling in places that's dangerous, and uh, so we want to pray for them, continue to do that, and for the people that are sick. But there's one person we want to lift up in prayer this week. Um, I don't know if you've been seeing on the news, but... Uh, there's an evangelical pastor that's been imprisoned in Turkey. The trial started last Monday, Pastor Andrew uh, Brunson, and we just want to continue to pray that that would work out well for him, okay? Don't forget that. Don't forget that the women's new Bible study is starting this Monday. We're starting the book of James with the men. Uh, the ladies are starting a new book, uh, and so you need to see my wife, Kyle, if you haven't got the book yet. Damsels in Defense. You ladies are the scariest of bunch of women in this town, and you still want to <laughs> learn how to defend yourself? I'm telling you. So it's April the 28th, 6 p.m. here at the church if you want to learn how to uh, throat punch some guy that would harass you in the parking lot. I guess that's what you guys are going to learn. Hey, we got a letter this week. I want to read real quickly before we get into our study this morning um, from somebody in the community that went through our walk through uh, Jerusalem tour. And we, we had, again, last year there were 700 people who walked through here that had never gone through before. Uh, this year, I don't think we counted, but there probably were four or 500 people uh, just by the expression on their face when they came through the tour that had never gone through before. Each year we reach a whole new group of people uh, that have never gone through and seen something dramatized in the way that we do it um, here. So... Just as encouragement to those that work so hard to put this on, and I've already let Chris read this letter. It says this, Dear members of Gold Country Calvary Chapel, RE, a walk through Jerusalem. I had the privilege to see your walk on Saturday, uh, the 31st. The more I reflect on the story told by the members of your church, the more pleasure I receive. The costumes, the scenery, the children and adults, uh, um, their work and their performance, it was breathtaking, and it brought me to tears of joy. And so she sent a little offering to the church to help us. Hey, we, you know, people, I've had people tell me they walk in this church and think we're poor. Uh, we're not poor. But she gave us money to put it on next year. You know, I had a guy come in here one time because we don't pass a plate and ask me, how do you give in this church? Do you guys have a wealthy benefactor that just supports it? And I said, as a matter of fact, we do. <laughs> we have a wealthy benefactor that supports this church. And every other thing we do around here, you know, it's incredible what a body of 200 people can do when they're committed to the Lord. And I was encouraged last week to share this with you. Do you know that we have at least 16 or 17? We just found out we have a new satellite church in Southern California. A lady called me in tears, 70 years old, said, I've never heard the word 
like I'm going through your doctrine class and heard it. She's felt like my husband and I have wasted all of this time. And they got a group of their neighbors coming over. And I, she, she had some questions. And I said, well, that's great. When you get done, we'll send you a, a certificate of completion. We do that. But we have 16 or 17 that we know of satellite churches around the United States that are tuning in right now. 25 different countries. We own property in Uganda that the buildings are built and paid for from this church. We own two acres in India. We built an orphanage there. We have four house churches. Um, we built a church in Belize, as you well know. We're involved in Honduras. Um, the doctrinal study that we did here a few years ago is being used in several Bible colleges in Africa. All because of what you have done. And not counting the six or seven churches we planted in the United States from this church. And so just you know, we may look like we have no two nickels to rub together, but God supplies our needs according to His riches in heaven, heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Every project He gives us, He funds. Yeah. He said, just step out in faith. Amen. All you've got to do is provide the manpower and the heart. I'll provide the means and the, the method, and I'll give you the money. And it's just so, yeah, it's rich seeing what God does. <laughs> so we do have a wealthy benefactor, as a matter of fact, we do. His name is God our Father. And he never lets us down, does he? Never. Amen. Well, let's turn our Bibles, come to a very interesting section this morning, Acts chapter 12. And as you're turning there to Acts chapter 12, put your finger there on verse 1, and let's pray. Father, we thank you. You know, we're, we're finally getting to the section there in the Acts of the Apostles where extreme warfare takes place. Uh, Lord, they've been being threatened, and they've been being beaten, and even Stephen was stoned, but that was by the Sanhedrin. But now the might of the Roman Empire will turn its face toward the church. Uh, Herod will think that he can, through his position and through his power, stop what God is doing. And we're going to find out this morning that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. No weapon. The God that we serve and the message that we have been given to preach cannot be stopped. In fact, Lord, you will deal harshly with those who resist. We're going to see it this morning in the text. And so, Father, give us strength this morning. Give us encouragement as we need it. Fill us with your spirit, Father. Put that fire and passion in us. Lord, I thank you that for 40, almost 43 years I've served you. You've been faithful to me, Lord. I can't say that I've always been faithful to you, but I will tell you, Lord, the fire never stopped burning in my heart toward you. It has never stopped. And I pray for more of it like I did this morning. So, Lord, speak to our hearts as we open this passage. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus we ask. And again, all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen, Amen. amen. Verse 1, chapter 12, Acts. Now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Now, uh, this is Herod the first. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. He is the nephew of Herod... Antipas, who was part of the tribunal that brought Jesus to trial. And so now we enter into a season, we're going to enter into a time when the focus of the government is to persecute the church, not just Judaism and not just the religious leaders of Judaism, but now the government that is dominating the world, the Roman Empire, will focus now on persecution against the church. And if you got your pen and pad out, let me give you a few things you need to know. Because we've been walking our way through the book of Acts. We've come through 11 chapters. And what we've seen on the day of Pentecost, number one, Peter stands up with the 11. He preaches a message about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He defends what is taking place there in Jerusalem as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit falls upon the Jews first. 3,000 get saved. Short time later, they're on their way to pray, and they come upon this man there at Gate Beautiful. They heal him. They preach in the porticos there uh, of Solomon's court. Another 5,000 get saved. 
Not only that, um, Philip goes down to Samaria and the whole town comes out and begins to receive the Lord. Then he's sent out to the desert where he meets an Ethiopian, preaches to one guy. We found out later when Christianity finally reaches Ethiopia, there's over 100,000 believers there because of one man. And then Peter, as we studied the last couple of weeks, goes to Cornelius' house and for the first time the Holy Spirit's poured out upon the Gentiles. And then Barnabas goes to Antioch. And great revival breaks out in Antioch. He goes and retrieves Paul from Tarshish and they're there for a whole year teaching. Listen, man, God is moving. And I will tell you this, every time God is moving, whether it's through a church, whether it's through a movement like Calvary Chapel was when it started in the 60s with our pastor Chuck, whether it's in your own personal life, know this, not only will you have uh, been noticed of by the Father, but you're going to have been noticed of by your enemy. Listen, Paul says we don't shadow box. We're not as those beating the air. We have a real enemy. And by the way, the Bible says that Satan has come but to steal, kill, and destroy. Spiritual warfare is real. That's why Paul says put on the whole armor. Having done everything to stand, stand against the wiles of the devil, the well-laid stratagems of the devil, because you have an enemy. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Hey, listen, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God to the pulling down of the strongholds of the wicked one. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We understand all of that, but it doesn't mean there won't be a battle. The battle could be raging in your head with doubts and fears. One of the things we're noting today as I'm ministering to so many pastors around the nation trying to encourage them, two things we're seeing coming to the fore in in this final battle, I think, before Jesus returns. Either Satan is accusing you today of your painful past. How many have a painful past? The rest of you are liars because the Bible says we all had our manner of life in times past. Come on, raise your hand. How many have a painful past that you you would not want anybody to know about? Isn't that cool that we get a new name when we get to heaven? So that we can kind of be incognito in our new life? He's either dredging up as the accuser of their brethren your painful past, or he's trying to make you fearful of the future. Listen, the Bible says God is not the author of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Fear doesn't come from the Lord. But we have a a wicked one. And that's why the Bible says he's like a roaring lion. When I was in Africa training pastors, one day night we were leaving the place I was staying and some of the African pastors were escorting me over to where we were going to be doing some open air preaching that evening. We'd finished teaching the pastors during that day. And I started looking around because, you know, I could sense something. You know, I didn't know if it was rebels because we had armed guards. Museveni, the president, had sent armed guards to take care of us as we were out in the region of Nicosia, the Loero district. Very dangerous place to be ministering the gospel. But I was looking around and one of the African pastors says, do you sense that? I go, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm sensing something. He goes, we didn't think you white people could sense things like this. <laughs> you talk about prejudice. I said, what are you saying? He said, well, there's lions in the area. That's one of the reasons why we're escorting you over And we know they're here. We know that we've seen their kills and we know they're around. Um, But you actually sense that. And I go, yeah, I do. Because there's lions where I live. They're called mountain lions, but they're still lions. And we had a conversation on the way to the church about lions. And they instructed me on why a lion roars. It's to strike fear in the heart of the prey so that it will panic And in that moment, it can gain mastery over it. So Satan's either dredging up your painful past and as the accuser of the brethren, trying to beat you up with that. Hey, listen, forget those things are behind or under the blood. Move forward. Or he's trying to make you fearful of the future. Listen, the same God is taking care of you today will be in your future because his promise is to never leave you nor forsake you. But spiritual warfare is real. And we're going to see this morning one of the greatest examples of it in the life of Peter. Now, we're going to see Peter here in chapter 12. We'll see him again in chapter 15, and then he fades from the scene. And the book of Acts, as far as Luke's record of this treatise, will just focus on Paul through the rest of the book of Acts. But in chapter 12, we have an interesting thing before us. Because here we have the outbreak and the onslaught 
of absolute unfettered persecution against the church. Every one of the apostles will die a martyr's death except for John, and he will die the death of an old age, which probably he would have preferred to have died a martyr's death seeing the things he had to go through uh, to get to that old age and finally being taken by the Lord. So as we look here at chapter 1, it says, Now about this time Herod... The king, he stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is the first of the apostles now that are going to be martyred. Uh, This is not James. We're going to see in a few moments the uterine brethren of Jesus. I say that because he's the half-brother of Jesus. Say, Mom, different dad. This is not that James. This is James, one of the sons of thunder. This is one of the, the boys of Zebedee. This is James and John. And it's interesting, every time you see them in the Scripture, they're together. In fact, Jesus ministered to the multitude. In case some of you guys think that churches can be clicky, Jesus ministered to the multitude. But out of the multitude, He had the twelve. Out of the twelve, He had three, Peter, James, and John. You always see them together. In fact, when they went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he left the other disciples behind. He took Peter, James, and John with him up there to see him transformed into his glory. And out of the three, according to John, he had the one. You know how John refers to himself? The one that Jesus loved. That's a little arrogant, isn't it? Jesus loves all of us. He's not a respecter of persons. But there are people that he has more intimate relationship with others. I find it interesting that the first martyr will be James. The last martyr will be his brother, John. Now they tried to, Domitian, the emperor at the time, tried to boil John in oil. You talk about a tough prophet. Now I've thought about ways to die. How many have thought about ways to die? I... (laughs) You guys know I got a list of ways I don't want to die. How many know what's at the top of my list? Sharks. Sharks. Dude, I am not going in the ocean. I do not want to be eaten by a shark. And I've got other ways I don't want to die. But I'm telling you, boiling in oil, that's on the list too. Think about it for a few moments. How many have been frying some fish you know, buy a stream in your pan with your grease and have some of it pop out on you. Not fun. They dunk John, his brother, in this boiling pot of oil and it has no effect on him. If I'd have been in John, I'd said, do it again. I need it. My skin is a little, you know, rough, you know. And so they, they exile him to the island of Patmos where he writes the book of Revelation. He's released from that island. He spends the last of his years in Ephesus with Polycarp, his disciple, and there he writes 3rd John, 2nd John, and the last letter that he pins is 1st John. Because he's concerned about the church cooling in its relationship with the Lord and false teaching coming in. It's one of my favorite books in the New Testament alongside of Jude, which writes at the same time, the last two of the apostles that had seen Jesus would have been Jude and John. But now this persecution begins and James is the first. And Herod takes him and by the sword has this man slain. And what I want you to see is that Jesus never promised it to be easy if uh, if you're a follower of Christ. Look with me at Matthew chapter 10. This is what he says to his disciples starting in verse 16. And we're just going to read through verse 18. And if you don't want to turn there real quick, there's a few verses we're going to reference. They'll put them up on the screens for you. Jesus says this concerning his disciples. And listen, you're a disciple and I'm a disciple. And if this truth was ever true, it's true today. I'm just talking to Keith uh, before the service. There are bills before our Congress uh, that if they're voted in are going to make it very difficult for us to minister the gospel in California. Uh, You know what? I'm I'm an old sheet metal worker. uh, So I know how to make license plates. That's okay if that's what God wants me to be doing in prison because I am not compromising the truth of God's Word for anyone. Won't do it for me, won't do it for them, won't do it for you. We will stand firm. And what God calls sin, we will call sin. And we will call those, those sinners to repentance. God doesn't hate sinners, He hates sin. God loves sinners. 
But persecution could be coming in ways that we're going to be reading about in the book of Acts to you and I. And James now is taken and he's killed. We read here in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16, Jesus speaking, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now that doesn't sound good to me. I don't know about you. Unless it's a Lambo. You know, you get, you know, tie the band and band around it. You know, that's what we have to be in these last days. A Lambo. If you, maybe none of you saw the movies Rambo, Rambo, Rambo 1, Rambo 2. Th- I think there's like nine of them. I don't know. <laughs> but Rambo defeats the whole Russian army with a bow and arrow. <laughs> and when the smoke clears and the dust settles, he's still standing. I'm telling you, you and I need to be Lambos. You ought to be a sheep with teeth. And you ought to be a sheep with, 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 you know, calluses on your knees because there's where the battle is fought. But Jesus is telling us early on, it's not going to be easy to be a true follower of Christ. You have to take up your cross, deny yourself and follow Him. That's the first thing. Jesus said, if they've hated me, are you greater than your master? They're going to hate you. And it's not you that they hate, it's the truth that you represent because you are salt and light in this world and you expose the wickedness and the darkness and the putrefaction of this world. And when you expose it, if they love darkness more than they love light, they're going to resist it. And not only will they resist it, they're going to kill the messenger because they don't like the message. I just, I don't mind them killing me at all. But not with sharks. You know, not with fire. Well, you know, Lord, just take me. But if I have to suffer, I'll, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it like, like Polycarp did in the arena while he was burning, preaching the gospel. And as the smoke ascended into that arena, it said that it smelled so sweet that hundreds and thousands came to Christ. James now taken and beheaded. It's interesting because Eusebius, the church historian, writes concerning a story that Clement, another church historian, wrote about James. In fact, the story goes like this, that the prisoner, James, was chained to a Roman guard while he was waiting the trial of his faith before Herod. And his witness was so strong to that Roman guard that the Roman guard came to Christ and was executed with James as a witness to his conversion. That's amazing to me. You know, they think that they chain us to soldiers. I can but imagine those soldiers because the Bible says the whole praetorian guard came to Christ, those men that were chained to Paul. Can you imagine being chained to Paul? Who was chained to who? I think some of those soldiers probably went away and said, man, I was there last month. You get him this week. I don't want anything more to do with the guy. But historians tell us the very guard that was chained to James, the first martyr, the first apostle to be martyred, came to faith because of the witness of James. Uh, Let me read you something that the Lord just shared with me, and he showed me this, this week as I was looking at that and just thinking about it. You know, as I read that, and as I read that, I turned to Eusebius and read that, and then I researched it and made sure that Clement had actually said that. I'm sitting there in my office, and I'm not kidding you. I, I, I didn't used to be an emotional guy until I got saved, but the tears ran down my face. I said, Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be like James. If in the future you choose to martyr me, And Lord, that's your business. It's not mine. I'm going to shout long and loud the truth of your word until you come for me, whether by grave or by the rapture, and I'm not compromising. I don't know what my future holds, and I'm not afraid of it. Because I know you'll be there in it with me. But if this is what you choose to do, these are the words that I wrote down as a prayer. And it's a prayer for all of us. And this is what I put pen to paper and said, those around us should be so moved by the witness in us 
that they also would take up their cross and deny themselves and follow the Christ that we love. That should be your witness. That was James's witness. The man that thought he had mastery over James, the man that took James as a prisoner and was chained to him, came to faith to the extent and to the degree, degree that when they beheaded James, he said, behead me too because I serve the same Christ that he serves. What an impact even in our persecution, even in those times where great um, persecution is coming, in, what, what a witness we can be. What a witness we can be. And so James now is killed by the sword. And it says there in verse 3, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews. Hey, politics haven't changed much, have they? He proceeded further to take Peter also. Let's just work our way through the apostles. Peter, James, and John. We've got James, now let's get Peter, we'll get John later. Probably was the mentality of Herod. And so watch what they do here. It says there in the rest of verse 3, this was done during the days of unleavened bread. Now Herod wanted to show himself to be somewhat of a respecter of Jewish tradition. And so he wouldn't do anything with Peter during the Passover. But his plan was after the Passover to kill Peter also so that the Jews would have some kind of garnered favor toward him. And so he puts Peter in prison. Watch this. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and he delivered him to a quaturian, a quaturian, that means 16 soldiers. Now you think they might be serious about Peter not getting away because he's gotten away before. You remember they arrested him and when they went to get him out of prison they couldn't find him and he was out there at the, up at the synagogue again preaching at the temple. So they assigned 16 soldiers to guard a fisherman. 16 seasoned soldiers to guard. I wonder how many demons God sends to try to hold you down and imprison you. I will say it's never enough, is it? Because the God we serve is greater. The Spirit in us is mightier. The truth that we have cannot be held down by chains or prison. Do you know that? Here's what we want to take away from our study this morning. Yes, we're going to be persecuted. Yes, listen, we've, we've garnered the devil's attention, especially this little church. Listen, because we believe God's truth and we act upon it. And we move as the Spirit leads and we do what the Spirit says. We're obedient to the Lord. And as we are doing that, I guarantee you, we've not only caught God's favor, we've caught the eye of the wicked one. And he wants to stop this. And I want to say when we get to heaven, neener, 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 so bad, you can't stop what God's doing. You cannot stop what God is doing. You can try to vote it out. You can try to vote it in. You can try to oppress it. You can have every political power against it. The hordes of hell and the hounds of hell can come out of hell and bark all they want. It won't stop what God is doing. Because what God has determined to take place, it is forever written in the heavens. And my days are numbered. And I'll be glad when my days are over, be very honest with you. How many are ready to go home? I'm more than ready to go home. You know, this ain't our home like we've been learning on, on uh, Wednesday nights going to Hebrews. It's not our home. So they assigned these men to guard Peter, this fisherman. Watch what it says in verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in the prison. Now, we know that this is not just any old prison. He's not just in the upper level prison. He's in the lower parts of the prison. In a few moments, we're going to see as this angel delivers him, he has to go out one gate, through another hallway, through another gate, then out the iron gate that leads into the city. He's going to pass a bunch of other guards on his way out, not including the ones that he's chained to at this moment. So I guarantee you there are times when Satan thinks he has you imprisoned, he has you in bondage, he has you right where he wants you, but he can't keep you. Do you know that? 
How many have felt like at one point in your life you've been in that prison, man, and you're chained, and, and there, there doesn't seem to be a way out? How many have been there? Raise your hand. This is interactive. How many have been in that place where you think there's no way out? Well, the God that we serve makes a way when there doesn't seem to be a way. He is a God of deliverance. He's a God that rescues. He's a God that restores. His arm is not short. He knows where you're at. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And that doesn't mean, because some of you guys are easy, I mean, to number the hairs on your heads. I won't say, you know, who, Bill or, or, or uh, Jim, but some of you guys are easy. It, it, the word actually means that he has numbered the hairs on your head. If I were to pluck one out, that might be 937. Now, if Bill or Jim pluck one out, that might be number four. You don't want to be plucking those out. But the truth of it is, God knows this inside and out. Steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Nothing in your life takes him by surprise. And I love Peter's reaction, and it ought to be ours when we find ourselves in those moments and in that time where it would seem like the enemies rushed in like a flood and all hell was broken out against us. And almost like we're fenced in, almost imprisoned and in bondage. We feel like the chains of the wicked one have wrapped around us again. You ever been there as a Christian where you have to look up to see down? Hey, 2 Timothy is Paul's last will and testament. He knows his time of departure, his hands, so the things that are important, the things that are dear to his heart, he writes to Timothy about. What an encouraging letter. But if that's true, 2 Timothy, Corinthians is his diary. We get a look into the life of Paul like at no other time. And he begins that letter by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble that befell me. To the degree that even at one point I despaired of life. I just wanted to give up. I was pressed hard on every side. I was pressed out of measure. But the Lord delivered me. And I trust he is delivering me, and I believe He will yet deliver me. If you're in that place, read 2 Corinthians. This is the great Apostle Paul who knew something about chains and imprisonment. We read about Peter. Now he's in prison. He's in the dank, dark, damp dungeon uh, in prison. And it says here, uh, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but, circle that word, but. Because with God, there's always that. You remember one of my favorite verses where it says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in His mercy and His great love, where He loved us. Can you imagine that? He rescued us. You know, you always have to factor, factor into every aspect of your life the God factor. You know, I'm sure Satan thought that he had destroyed. In fact, the Bible says that he thought that he had destroyed the plan of God when he crucified Jesus. But had he known what God was doing, he'd have never done it. Because on the third day when he came forth with the keys of death held in the grave in his hand, every demon screaming because nothing could bind him. Listen, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is you and, and you and me. God has forgiven us of our past. It's washed in the blood. And there's no future that we need to fear. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can pluck us out of His hand. No charge can be brought against us. Nothing can separate us from Him. I'm convinced of that. I'm persuaded of that. Nothing. Death, height, dominion, power, death, nothing will separate me from God's love for me because I'm His son. You're His sons and daughters. I like Peter, because Peter understands this, obviously, because watch what it says here. So, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The word there for prayer is an interesting word. It's the same prayer, the same word for prayer that was used in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying. It's ektenos, and it means to be stretched beyond measure. I mean, this is a sincere, earnest prayer. When, when it says there in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 44, just let me read it for you. It says this, and being in agony, this is speaking of Jesus, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat were as it were drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Listen, the blood vessels burst in his forehead. He was under such stress when he was praying there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Father, if there's any other way, 
Uh, let this cup pass from me. And again, I've told you, I don't think Jesus was afraid of the beating and the scourging. I don't think he was afraid of the mocking. I don't think he was afraid of having his beard plucked out or the crown of thorns on his head. I don't think he was af- uh, afraid of being nailed to that cross. But I think the thing that scared Jesus is he knew that for six hours when he hung between heaven and earth, he would be separated from his Father. And the sins of the world without a mixture would come upon him. And the bulls of Bashan, the demon forces, would be dancing around him. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, thine be done. If that's what's necessary, then let's get it on, Lord. Father, let's go. That same word for agony is the same word used for the church here. You see, I think the problem why we don't see the things that we want to see is we don't know how to agonize in prayer. You know, we pray for a little bit and the thing doesn't happen, we just move on. Well, you didn't really mean it, you didn't really need it. How many have some life-dominating sin that you want to be free of? You can be free of it if you agonize in prayer. That means to be stretched beyond measure. The, the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of righteous men and women avails much. After putting on the whole armor of God in our protective sense, the Bible says about the sword of the Spirit, which is our offensive thing, the shield of faith that stops the fiery darts, but it says praying always with all prayer and supplication. One of the greatest powers and strength that God's given to the church is the thing we use the least. Prayer. Paul said he prayed without ceasing. Here the church has already traumatized James has been taken and has been beheaded by Herod. Now they've got Peter. Now Peter's in prison. They're picking off the apostles. We need prayer meeting. We need to be fasting and praying. We need to get serious with God. This can't continue. And they're bathing this situation in prayer. They're agonizing the same way Jesus agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're agonizing for Peter and for Peter's deliverance. And it says in verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was up worrying and pacing, uh, didn't know what, biting his fingernails, just completely stressed out of his head, didn't know what was going to happen the next day. Man was completely freaked out, was wanting to write letters of resignation. I'm done, God, this is too far, you've asked too much. Is that what we read? No, that would have been me. No, it wouldn't have been me. What do we find Peter doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. How can you sleep at a time like this? Well, let me tell you how. Because you know the God that you committed your life to. Peter's already a dead man. He already knows it. He's dead in Christ. But he knows he lives. He knows his life is not his own. It's been bought with a price. He's already surrendered it to the Lord. He's already persuaded that God's able to keep it if he wants and if he doesn't, to God be the glory. That's how you sleep. And let me tell you a little secret. That's how you sleep. That's how I sleep in times of stress. Do you belong to the Lord? Is he your God Is he your master? Is he your Lord and Savior? Then if he is, you are in his hand and nothing can pluck you out of that. And it doesn't matter what we have to go through. God is in control of my life. I love what Paul said. Remember he's going to Jerusalem because he was convinced if he could just talk to the Jews about the gospel, his, his people... Although he was an apostle to the Gentiles, he just knew if he could just share the gospel, they'd respond. And all the way to Jerusalem, to get there before the feast, prophets warned him, listen, you're going to go bound. You're going to go. And finally he says, enough. Listen, I, I, I already gave my life to the Lord. And it doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm persuaded that what I've already committed to him, he's able to keep. Are you committed to that degree? Because I, I think that if... Jack Hibbs has it right, one of our Calvary pastors out in Southern California, is staying really in tune with what's going on, especially in California. You, you can watch him on Sunday nights. They have him and Don Stewart have this kind of a, a thing, a forum, really good, really interesting. 
that things are coming down the pike that you and I may have to uh, suffer for our faith. Maybe some of you already are. Maybe some of you are going through some intense warfare right now. And you're not sleeping very well. Well, let me tell you why you're not sleeping very well. You don't trust the one who already redeemed you. You've forgotten who he is. You've forgotten what he is. You've forgotten that all power and authority belong to him. And not one thing will come your way that he doesn't allow. Not one thing. Here's what Psalms 127 verse 2 says. It is vain for you to rise up early. How many of you are so stressed out you just can't sleep and you just get up? Man, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning and you're up. And you don't just get up. You try to wake your wife up or your husband. Everybody got to get up. If I got to get up, everybody's up. Because you're stressed out. You rise up or set up late. How many just can't go to sleep because you're just stressed out? You're worried about the bills. You're worried about this. You're worried about that. How many have some sleepless nights? You've been up late. Uh, or it says, uh, the eat bread of sorrow. Uh, how many have just, were, you, you've, you've lost your appetite because you're so stressed out? Anybody? Say amen to that one. Anybody ever been there? Well, here's what the psalmist says. For so he giveth to his beloved sleep. It's a rebuke. Why are you going through that? Why are you allowing that to happen? Don't you trust the Lord? Go to sleep. Don't worry about it. In fact, in the New Testament, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, this is one of my favorite verses. I wore the ink off the page on this verse reading it when I was a new Christian. Because, man, I was one of those kind of anxious, how many have been anxious Christians when you first got saved? Man, you worried about everything. Now, you would say you were praying, but you were worrying. You weren't praying, you were worrying. And here's what it, what it says. It, the word for careful in Old King James, New King James, if you've got a New King James translation that says anxious, that's probably the more proper translation there. Be anxious for nothing. That word anxious means to be filled with anxiety. The Bible says we're to be filled with anxiety about nothing. Here's Peter. Sixteen soldiers are chained to him. He's behind uh, in a cell behind a prison bar. He knows out the corridor there's another prison gate. He's got to go upstairs to another prison gate. And then there's an iron gate that keeps them, those prisoners, in before they go into the city. He knows that Herod has already killed James with the sword. He knows that the crowd applauded that, that is the Jews, and now Peter's arrested. He knows that the Passover is just about over and at any moment, probably the next day, he could be taken up and beheaded as well. What does Peter do? Hmm. Man. Push up some straw before my pillow. He just pushed up some straw. My straw. (laughs) You'll get it on the way home. Laid his head down. Said, so God, you got this one. I'm going to be filled with anxiety about nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, your Father. And the peace of God, your Father, that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I wonder if Peter and Paul might have had a conversation about that. He said, hey, Peter, I got a good one for you to write down. You know that church at Philippi that's all stressed out? Hey, tell them this one. It's what I learned when I was in prison. Peter said, hey, I already know that one. I've been in prison too. What are you, what are you saying? You're not the only apostle that's been in prison. Maybe today you feel like you're in prison financially, emotionally, spiritually, maritally, some relationship. Be anxious for nothing. Put your head on my pillow and go to sleep. God's got it. That's what he's saying. Peter's asleep. Now, this is funny. You you, You have to 
When you read Scripture, put yourself in it and listen to what's being said, because this is humorous. So it says there that he's, he's asleep between two soldiers bound with two chains. The keepers are before the doors that kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord came unto him, and a light shined in the prison. And listen, he had to smoke Peter. That's old King James. He has to shake him to wake him up. He, I'm telling you what, he's in rim sleep. Man, he's probably dreaming about heaven. The angel has to shake Peter. Peter, wake up. Now watch how the angel has to, I mean, lead Peter by the hand. Wake up, Peter. And so he smote him on the side. And then he says, now, Peter, get up. Peter, get up. And now the chains fell off of Peter. And then it says in verse 8, and then the angel said, now, Peter, put on your coat, put on your shirt, get dressed. Now, bind your sandals on your feet. The angel's dressing him. Now, get your sandals on your feet. And so he did. And he said to him, now cast your coat across your shoulder. We're leaving. We're not coming back. Don't leave anything here. And Peter's probably trying to wipe the sleep out of his eyes. Okay, 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 okay. okay I, got, I got my coat. I got, okay. Uh, uh, what? Oh, oh, sandals. Okay, I got my sandals. Now, don't forget your coat. Okay, I got my coat. Where are we going? And then verse 9 says, and he went out and followed him. And Whence not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. He thinks he's dreaming. I imagine if you went to sleep in prison, you might dream about getting out. And he's dreaming. Verse 10 says, When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Automatic. Listen, God has an automatic gate opener for every prison that the devil would try to put you in. And when you pray, he just pushes the button. And you get to go out. Some prisons we stay in after the Lord has already opened the door. Be careful about those. Footnote, doesn't cost you any extra. Because sin shall not have dominion over you. You have mastery over it. Don't stay in a prison cell when the door has already been opened and the guards are all knocked out. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? And so, he, he, you know, he walks out the iron gate. He passes on onto the streets. And forthwith, the angel just departed from him. I've actually had this happen to me. We're broke down alongside the road, have a car pull up, help me out, long ways down either road. And then when I'm done wanting to thank them, gone. See, when you drive old cars, especially Fords, you need angels. Uh, that's why I repented and started driving a Toyota so I don't have to have those guardian angels anymore rescuing me alongside of the road. But I've had this happen to me. I, some of you have too. You know that God has given His angels charge over you. So the angel just splits. Verse 11 says, when Peter was come to himself, he came to his senses. Verse 11 says, he said, now I know of a surety of a truth that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all expectation of the people of the Jews. Now I know when I read in the Bible where it says that God would give his angels charge over, over thee in a time of trouble, now I know it's true. Listen, when you read the Bible, it should be as true that moment before you ever have an experiential uh, encounter with it. When I read the Bible, I read it as though it is absolutely what it declares itself to be, the inerrant, inspired, authoritative Word of God. And I trust it like I trust. I trust it more than I trust anything else. It's like we, we studied in Hebrews chapter 11 just last week, that faith is the confidence of the things expected. It is the evidence of things not yet seen. As these physical eyes view the material world and give us information, our spiritual eyes view the 
spiritual world and give us information. And it's just as tangible to us in the spirit realm as it is into the physical realm. I am persuaded that one of these days, if, if I can just lose a little weight and live a little longer, that I'm going to make the rapture. And Jesus Christ is coming for me. And in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, just like the Bible declares, this flesh, this corruption is going to put on incorruption. This mortal is going to become immortal. And I'm going to be caught away, harpazo, with great force to meet the Lord in the air. And I will ever be with the Lord. He's going to wipe every tear from my eyes. There's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more parting. The former things are done away with. And I'm going to spend eternity with the one who rescued me. I know that day's coming. I just want to live to it. And if I don't make it to the rapture and I go by the grave, then I'm going to ask the Lord, after all you guys are there, Lord, just put me back and pull me back up. I want to experience that. <laughs> I'm so bummed out when Pastor Chuck didn't get to go to the rapture. I hope the Lord sends him back and just pulls him up so he can experience it. Or Billy Graham. I'm an old drag racer. I know about E.T., elapsed time. I know the first 60 feet are the most exciting. You let go of the trans brake, wheels in the air, man, your back is planted to the seat, and away you go. What is it going to be when that last trump sounds? And we hear the voice say, come up hither. Wow. And eye hath not seen, and ear hath not heard. It's not entered in your heart the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. And then I can eat all I want and never get another pound. Mm. Pass that angel food cake right on down here. I don't want any deviled eggs. Just give me the angel food cake. <laughs> and so he's there. Verse 12. And when he had considered the things, he, he came to his ho the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark is introduced to us here. He'll be a traveling partner of Barnabas later on in the book of Acts where many were gathered for prayer. Now watch it. This is humorous. Oh, we got five minutes to get this done. Well, oh man, we got communion this morning. Okay, we're going to have to leave you right there. We'll pick this up. This gets really funny. Can, can I do just two more verses? Because this is really humorous. And so Peter knocks at the door of the gate and the damsel, if it's a damsel, it's a young girl, usually under 12. This young girl came and, and whose name was Rhoda, she sees Peter there at the door. She recognizes his voice, and she's so moved with gladness, and she's so excited, she forgets to open the door, and she runs and tells the people in the prayer meeting, hey, Peter's here. Now, watch their response. They all jump up and say, prayer's answered. Let's go embrace Peter. No. Listen, sometimes your prayers may be earnest, but they need to be prayers of faith not just earnest. And, and so they said to her, thou art mad. You're out of your mind. We're praying for Peter. Peter's in prison. What do you think this prayer meeting's about? You're out of your mind. We're praying that Peter would get released. So get down here and pray. And she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And then they said, it's an angel. Like it's easier to believe that an angel's at the door than Peter delivered from prison. By the way, and you're praying and fasting earnestly for Peter to be delivered. You talk about humorous, but isn't that us? We've seen people miraculously healed in the front of this church as we prayed for them. You know what they say to us? I can't believe it. I said, that's been the problem. If you had to believe sooner, you would have got healed faster. They're praying for Peter's deliverance. God delivers Peter while they're praying. Peter is at their door knocking. This girl sees him, Rhoda. She runs and says, Peter's at the door. They say, you're mad. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. No, 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 no. It's really, it's Peter. He's at the door. Not nah, just an angel. Don't worry about it. Get, let's pray for Peter. <laughs> but Peter continued to knock. And when it was opened the door to him, they were astonished. We should never be astonished at what God can do. We should be grateful, thankful, but never astonished.
because our God can do exceedingly, watch the superlatives, exceedingly, abundantly above. Bad grammar, good theology. Exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think through Christ Jesus. Amen. Chains fall off, prison doors open. Angels come. God will set you free. Trust Him. Amen. Well, worship team, come. We'll leave you there. Catch up next week. Get the ushers to come as well. Let's stand this morning if you can, and if you can't, then you can remain seated. But hey, if Jesus could hang on a cross for six hours, certainly we could stand for a few moments while we honor that great event through communion. Amen? Amen? Listen, don't let Satan beat you up about your painful past nor make you fearful of your future. When Satan comes and accuses you of your past, just remind him of his future. When he tries to make you fearful about your future, just tell him, my name's written in a book of life. Where's your name written? Jesus promised in John chapter 1 to come back for me. John chapter 14, verse 1, to come back for me. But when he comes for you, Satan, you better hide. Amen. Listen, guys, we're going home one of these days, and I think it's soon. I want it to be soon. Don't you? And when we get there, don't say, I can't believe it. I'm here. You should already be persuaded of that. Amen. I'm telling you, heaven is more real to me than this pulpit because I see it every day. I think about it. It owns my heart. It owns my passion. It's my worldview. It's my hope. I'm just a pilgrim and a sojourner. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. Do you belong here? Uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, come quickly. That's what he told us to pray, didn't he? Well, let's pray right now for the, for the Lord's table that he would just remind us of his love and of his forgiveness. Hold the cup, hold the bread. We'll eat and drink in a few moments together. Father, bless the table. Bless, Lord, the bread and the cup that's on this table as it's being, as it's being distributed, Lord. And in these moments, while we're waiting for the cup and the bread to come to us, Lord, remind us of your love. Remind us, Lord, of your forgiveness and of your grace. Remind us again, Lord, of your mercy and your long suffering. Remind us again, Lord, that we are one with you and one with every follower of Christ. We're brothers and sisters, and we ought to act that way. And so we ask these things this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. All God's kids would say, amen. 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 Hey, let's worship as uh, the cup and the bread are being distributed.
there's no more shame to love when the heavens pass away when the heavens pass away all your scars will still Tell your neighbor this represents the payment for your sin. No, tell your neighbor because, you know, we need to hear that. I don't want you leaving here thinking that the sin is still on you. Listen, you don't stink anymore. No, you don't. Sin makes you stink and you don't. By his stripes, you're healed. What? Yeah. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. He has to tell us that twice in the book of Hebrews. Once in chapter 8, in case we forget again in chapter 10. Because he tells us by one sacrifice he has perfected forever those that he has made Father, bless this bread which represents the payment for our sins. The body of Christ broken for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's eat together. Mm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hold the cup up. Tell your neighbor, this has washed me as clean as snow. Because without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there's no remission of sins. Listen, your sins aren't just covered like in the Old Testament. Listen, your sins are gone. Amen? As far as God is concerned, they are. Do you know that? And it's all because of the blood of Jesus, not because of your efforts, not because of your works, because of Jesus. That's why it's the sweetest name we know. Jesus. Yeshua. Our Messiah. Amen. Father, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the shed blood of the sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Lord, as we drink, just remind us again, although our sins be many, It doesn't matter. You know, like Pastor Todd said, and I've said it often, and I'll say it again this morning, it doesn't matter where you slept or who you slept with. It doesn't matter what you snorted up your nose, guzzled down your throat, and held in your lungs, unless you're Clinton, and held in your lungs or injected in your arms. It doesn't matter what you did or who you did it to. The blood of Christ is powerful, and it can wash away all sin. And we thank you for that this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, let's drink. Ah, thank you, Father. One more song. I'm over a little bit, I know. Don't email me this week and tell me. The clock is working just fine. But I want to sing the river song. (laughs) Yes. I'm happy to be in the truth, aren't you? Thank you, Father. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always 
sing a when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains, over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open. say this just before we leave I've studied theology I've taught theology it's the greatest theology I ever learned little kids sing in our Sunday school Jesus loves me this I know do you know that church Jesus loves me this I know because this Bible tells me so But Jesus loves me when I'm bad. Even though it makes him sad, Jesus loves you and me. How much? You guys know it. How much? How much? How much? Amen. Father, thank you this morning for just again reminding us that no weapon formed against us will prosper. We got things coming at us left and right in the church and want to outlaw Bible cells in California. We got Mr. Moonbeam up there doing weird things and, and all of the, the crazy Democrats and this, you know, Lord, let's call it what it is. They're nuts. They're, 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 they're not serving you, Lord. But I worry about none of these because I serve the God who spoke the universe into existence, who never had a beginning and will never have an end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And all authority is in his hand. And I committed my life to him a long time ago. So no weapon formed against me will prosper until you are done with me, Lord. And it'd be okay if they took off my head. That'd be fine. Just don't let them feed me the sharks. (laughs) But Lord, whatever. I'm already a dead man. I died to myself a long time ago. And my life is yours. And I trust you, Lord. We trust you, Father. Whatever we have to face in the future, Lord, 
We face it with the knowledge that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. 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 If you need prayer, we'll be up here to pray with you and for you and anoint you with oil. And if not, you are dismissed to fellowship.